Welcome to The Poorcast. I'm your host, Carly Harmson. As a licensed master esthetician with nearly two decades of experience, I feel confident to meet you here every week to educate about the latest trends and must-have products, as well as to decode the science and demystify the overwhelming world of skincare. Whether you're a wide-eyed, curious beginner or you're a veteran skincare pro, this is the podcast for you. So grab your favorite face mask and discover with me someone who's not only a skincare guru, but also a card-carrying member of Skincare Obsessed, just like you. Get ready for this episode of The Podcast, starting now. Hey there. Hope you're having a great day today. I am actually headed to some surgery next week. So I am at long last getting the surgery I have needed on my right hand where I've been suffering with carpal tunnel on and off for pretty much my whole career. But it's gotten to the point where my hand is numb every night I sleep since about 2017. The thing that finally (laughs) got me into the doctor to get it checked out and ultimately to schedule surgery was that my right hand uh, a few weeks ago was going numb like chronically, like throughout the day. I was having a hard time typing. And so all of this to say, wish me luck in surgery next week on Valentine's Day. But also for those of you that are in this industry that work as a skin professional or a beauty professional, take care of your, your hands. When I was in school 20 years ago, we weren't taught like body mechanics body awareness, stretching the hands, you know, stretch in between your clients, certainly to start your day and to end your day so that you can preserve your money makers. So today we're going to talk about the barrier. Have you heard all of the buzz that surrounds the skin barrier? The concept of the skin barrier, barrier repair, damage barrier is certainly on the rise. The phrase or keyword search of barrier repair is up 33% in the last year with keywords relating to include products for barrier repair and barrier repair ingredients. Much of the content being searched on TikTok with get this, an increase of views using the hashtag skin barrier from 300 million to 2.9 billion in just one year. So content continues to be sought out on YouTube and Instagram respectively as well. Peruse any skincare community thread And you'll read regularly sentiments like, I need help. I think something's wrong with my barrier. I need help healing my barrier. Or one that always makes me laugh. I think that product broke my barrier. (laughs) And you can't break a barrier. It's not like breaking the internet. But we certainly can damage the barrier. Compromise the barrier. Don't even get me started on like the new slew of new products and brands that are focused around barrier repair. They're being launched every single day. Can you say skin fix? So I'm here to give the girlies what they want, which is all the things skin barrier. So let's start by talking about what the skin barrier is. Is it a literal barrier? Is it a function of the skin? The answer is both. The skin barrier, also known as the moisture barrier, acid mantle, hydrolipidic barrier. There's a, a lot of names that this literal and fun- <laughs> this literal layer and function of the skin go by, but simply it's the most, the outermost layer of the skin that protects against outside external aggressors while also preventing moisture loss in the skin. So it's a simple definition that I just gave you and I'm many things, but definitely not simple. So let's dive in a little deeper. So as mentioned, the skin barrier is located in the upper layers of the skin. This is known to those that are trained and professionals as the stratum corneum of the epidermis. And it is made up of corneocytes. These are desquamated, flattened keratinocytes. And FYI, a keratinocyte is the technical name for cells made up of keratin, which is the protein that in essence forms our hair, our skin, and our nails. So corneocytes are the cells in their late stage cycle of life. They are hardened, they are dead, they are crusty. (laughs) In other words, these are like zombie cells that sit on top of our skin that, yes, do still have a benefit even though they are dead. And that benefit is that they help to protect the lower layers of the more youthful cells. So for any like diehard Game of Thrones fans, (laughs) I'm reminded of a scene from Battle of the Bastards. Jon Snow is the youthful cell underneath being protected by all the 
dead on top. If you know, you know. I digress. Those corneocytes are bound and connected by together by lipids and fats and other components like ceramides and what we call GAGs, lovingly in the, in the biz, glucosaminoglycans. And probably the most known glucosaminoglycan is hyaluronic acid, which I'm sure you've heard of before. This is definitely a popular ingredient in skincare, but it's also naturally occurring in the in the skin. So this mixture of lipids, fats, ceramides, gags creates a waterproof mixture that works almost like a glue or a mortar that holds our skin cells together. We call this an extracellular matrix officially, but it does form that literal and bi-directional layer or barrier that essentially keeps the good stuff in and the bad stuff out. So when working optimally, the skin barrier is going to help to prevent pathogens, allergens, and toxins from dropping into the skin. This is a good thing. If we constantly have our skin being assaulted by these allergens, toxins, pathogens, we might have a little low-grade inflammation happening at all times, maybe some redness or irritation. So this is a really important feature of the skin. Oh, and a side note, the skin barrier works very closely with the skin microbiome. That is a, an area of skin health that I'm really passionate about. So I'm sure at some point down the road, we will definitely spend a, an episode or two talking about the skin microbiome. So when the skin barrier is compromise, what does that actually mean? Essentially, there are weak areas in this layer that's made up of all of that stuff, the skin cells, the glue that holds them together, made up of lipids and fats and proteins and ceramides. So what happens is there's weak areas in this, this layer, this mixture. It's almost like a kind of protective mesh layer, which again, should allow for good stuff to get into the skin, like hydration, like water, but should prevent bad guys like pathogens, allergens, and toxins to get through, get past that first line of defense. And of course, when it cannot, because it is weakened or there's literal holes in this protective layer, it can result in unhealthy skin issues or worse, like serious skin conditions like eczema, urticaria, or acne. So we know what causes that weakened barrier. And one of my favorite skin educators and influencers in the space is Dr. Whitney Bow. She's written a couple books that I really love. She's a board certified dermatologist and she compares this compromised barrier to like a leaky gut. So if you've ever heard of the term of a leaky gut or gut permeability, that can have a whole cascade of other issues associated with it because little bits of food and things are, are able to pass through that gut barrier that that really shouldn't be passing through, which can trigger like an allergic response or inflammation. It's kind of the same idea. We have these, again, these weakened areas that are more permeable than they are meant to be, which can allow these things to like pathogens, harmful bacteria to get through that first line of defense. So how does the skin get to this state? We're, it's not a skin type. We're not born with a compromised barrier. It's a condition. It's something that happens over time. So let's kind of talk about, I think, an important distinction, which is sensitive skin versus sensitized skin. One consumer perception study recently that had over a thousand participants showed that 70% of those participants, they self-reported as having sensitive skin. They thought they had sensitive skin, but sensitive skin is a skin type. It's genetic. You got what your mama gave you sort of thing. And what it literally means is Sensitive skin, people that have that, the epidermis is actually thinner, which allows things like vascularity to be closer to the surface, which is why we see more redness, rosiness, blushing with sensitive skin. It also allows or means that the nerve endings are closer to the surface. A true sensitive skin is going to feel pressure, pain, heat, cold, much more intensely. This is why I always say I'm a baby when I am, you know, should go get my microneedling treatment to help with some of my scarring from acne that I formerly had. I, even with numbing, I feel that shit way more intensely than like a normal skin. And so it's not, it's not enjoyable. I don't want to do it, which is why I constantly put it off. So this is an example of a true sensitive skin. And we know statistically speaking, 70%, you know, this, this large group sample of 70% of people do not genetically have thinned epidermis. Sensitized skin, on the other hand, 
is way more prevalent, way more common. And it is a condition, which means it's conditional. This is usually caused by outside factors like environmental aggressors, diet, lifestyle, medications. And honestly, what I'm seeing more often than not is improper topical products, ingredients, and treatments. So I, I'm not surprised that it seems like sensitive skin is on the rise when in fact it is sensitized skin. When we live in this era of TikTok skincare, viral skincare, which is so influential, so powerful, so impactful, it's not a surprise to me that we have more and more people with really compromised barriers, sensitized skin, as well as like increase in issues like acne. So back to the study, we're over a thousand participants. Again, that's a big sample, folks. They self-reported to have sensitive skin when in reality they had sensitized or, or a large portion of them have or had sensitized skin, a compromised skin barrier. As I just alluded to a second ago, compromise or damage barrier outside of wind, cold, sun exposure, it really comes down to this simply, and that's doing too much. Doing too much skincare over-processing the skin, over-exfoliation. Again, those are inappropriate products on the skin that maybe aren't meant for that skin type or that condition, or they're misusing that product. They're overusing and they're using it too frequently, for example. So I'm sure many of you have heard this cultural shift with what we're calling Sephora kids, right? These Gen A that are going and buying 12-step routines. And there's videos, viral videos online where you see these really entitled children that are demanding retinol products from Drunk Elephant. And all I can think to myself is what the hell are we doing? I am all for teaching tweens and young adult, you know, young kids proper hygiene and in some cases skincare at 10 years old, maybe a cleanser and a moisturizer, certainly an SPF. But I don't know that we need to do anything beyond that unless acne is starting that early. Generally, we see acne a, a few years later when the hormones really ramp up and testosterone really increases in both boys and girls. So what are we doing? There is no reason that these kids should be using hydroxy acids or retinol. And what ultimately is going to happen is they're going to damage that barrier. Their skin is really quite delicate still at that age. So they're going to compromise that barrier. They're going to make their skin more photosensitive, which means accelerated aging down the road. Because we know a 10-year-old may use a retinol product here and there, and they're less compliant with just daily sunscreen. It just doesn't make sense to me. And I want to kind of go down that rabbit hole another time. But it'll be interesting to see, we see with Gen Z, some accelerated or premature aging. I've got theories on that. But with this Gen A, I think we're really going to see some damaged skin coming up up if you know what I'm seeing online is at all a reflection of a part of this this group of kids. So to be continued that conversation, but that would be a, a great example of inappropriate products used inappropriately on the wrong skin types or conditions. Other things that you know you might see even more often that people think is pretty harmless could be like washing with bar soap. So I always joke it's you know using the Irish spring that your husband uses to clean his pits and bits and you're washing your face with that in the shower too gag uh straight to gel uh but really the problem beyond that's disgusting what i just that visual i just gave you really the problem is a lot of these bar soaps are more of an alkaline ph you know soap kind of originated with the use of lye which is very alkaline on the ph scale and while it does feel kind of skin softening like repeated consistent use of a product like that that's keeping your skin really alkaline is over time, it's going to affect your microbiome by creating a pH that is inhospitable to the good bacteria of the skin. But it's also going to gradually start to wear down that barrier function, making the skin really susceptible to all kinds of problems and issues and inflammation and redness. So, you know, you when we cleanse our skin, we really should be cleansing our skin with something that's pH balanced to the skin. That's That means it's actually slightly acidic, like just a little acidic. That's where our skin likes to live on that pH scalp. Some trending home treatments like regular facial steaming. Listen, I'm a fan of, of steaming in the treatment room to use as a tool to assist, uh, assist with extractions or maybe to put over a mask to kind of make that skin heat up so it's a little more permeable so we can drive some of those active ingredients in it. That's really the true purpose of a steam. There's not a great reason for people to be steaming at home regularly. If, you know, they are in the situation that they just cannot get regular facials from a pro and they 
they do their own little DIY facials, that steamer really shouldn't be used more than a couple times a month, I would say. With that repeated steam and heat, it could be potentially problematic for the skin barrier and the skin microbiome. Again, creating that like inhospitable environment. So that's one that I've seen like really trendy. Please don't, please don't steam your face at home. Or if you do, make it a special treat for something you do a few times a month. Tretinoin. Tretinoin is huge right now. And historically, it was really only available by your dermatologist. You had to make an appointment, you had to do the skin check, do the full thing and get you'd, you'd get the topical prescription product. Today, it's way more accessible. You can just go online and, and pretty much buy it, even though it's a prescription. And so people are using tretinoin, which is a, a topical form of vitamin A when they maybe don't need to. I always say that vitamin A is for the two A's, aging and acne. If you don't have either of those, you shouldn't use it. And while some people might argue it's anti-aging, it does have some antioxidant properties. The the problem is, is that it makes your skin more photosensitive. So unless you are 100% compliant and diligent with your sun protection, you are putting your skin at risk to prematurely age. For me, it's always a risk versus reward type of conversation. So in most cases, if you don't have aging or acne, you do not need tretinoin. However, we have everybody using it. Everybody's using tretinoin. We have this condition of being human, of human nature, which is if as little is good, more is better. So if using it a couple times a week is good, every night must be better. Or if using 0.025%, the low concentration is good, then using 0.1% must be better. And it's just not true, especially when it comes to the barrier. Thanks for tuning into this week's episode of The Podcast. If you like this episode, be sure to share it with a bestie or on your socials. And if you love the episode, please leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. Your positive feedback means so much to me. You can connect with me at The Real Best Statistician on Instagram or The Best Statistician anywhere else. And hey, babe, this week's forecast looks like clear with a chance of glow. See you next time.